On the edge of the Gulf, next to Dubai, is Sharjah. Every international team plays here, including England. Nowhere else have there been so many allegations of cricket match-fixing or of games being linked to the underworld. These matches have attracted an international gambling network. The man who owns and runs Sharjah cricket is Sheikh Bukhatiya. He accepts that there is a problem. We are not saying that there is no match fixing, because that's not in our area. Obviously, it's now very clear that a match is fixed between two people, a bookie and a player. When England's cricket team came to Sharjah in 1997 to play in a one-day tournament, its captain was Adam Holyoke. As soon as he walked into his hotel on the evening before the game, he realised something was wrong. Basically arrived in my hotel room to be greeted after about four or five minutes by a, a phone call from an anonymous caller asking me information about what my batting lineup was going to be and uh, who I was going to bowl first, what I was going to do if I won the toss, etc, etc. Five minutes later I was um, received another phone call, um, this time by um, someone different saying that I'd spoken to his colleague uh, a few minutes earlier and saying that uh, if I wanted to become very wealthy um, that I, sh I should um, basically speak to him and arrange to meet with him. So I hadn't even played my first game as captain of England at the time and I'd basically played five one-day internationals so for, for me it was um, disturbing to say the least. Polyoke refused the offer and reported the incident. He's not the only player to have been approached in Sharjah to fix matches for cash. You know, Sharjah is something someone needs to investigate very seriously but because there is clearly incredible temptation to mess around with, with the results, with the games, to lure players. I mean, it all exists there. I mean, it's, it's that kind of a cauldron. I don't think every game in Sharjah was fixed, but if, let's say, two or three important games are fixed, uh, it makes a whole mockery of a tournament. In tournaments in other parts of the world, there have been similar accusations. Eight test-playing countries have faced allegations of corruption. Players have been accused of underperforming, conspiring to throw matches, and of selling inside information to bookmakers. Vast sums are riding on the game. We've only touched the tip of the iceberg. I think it goes a lot deeper. I don't think it's just the players involved. I think it's a much wider network. You know, I've heard figures as much as a billion US dollars changing hands in one test match. A billion dollars? US dollars in one test match around the world, one test match result. So to offer someone a few hundred thousand or 50,000 or whatever in cash is small fry. So uh, there's a lot of money involved. The ICC, the game's top governing body, has known about the rumours of match fixing for years. It now admits it should have done more. I think that the ICC, the same as, uh, the, same as the public generally and, and the media, didn't realise uh, that uh, the matter was as bad or as genuine as it obviously was. In the last 18 months, it's been said many times, including by me, that the cricket officials were slow to act and didn't uh, re react quickly enough. Uh, that's on the record everywhere. But, as I said, um, we didn't realise it was as deep or as widespread as it ha has proved to be. But according to others, the authorities didn't act sooner because they were more interested in protecting cricket's image. There was a great deal of frustration because we knew that players and managers of the game in private were talking about match fixing, were willing to admit to match fixing, but in public everyone's stance was no, nothing happens. This summer, England is playing two of the teams which have been investigated for corruption, Pakistan and Australia. Last year, the captain of Pakistan, Salim Malik, was banned for life for match-fixing. In Australia, Shane Warne admitted taking money for helping bookmakers. 
England's Alex Stewart is under investigation after allegations, which he denies, that he did the same. It was in India last year that the story of the international network of cricket corruption first became public. Cricket is almost a religion here. Its followers couldn't have known of the corrupt activities of Hansi Kronje when he came here last spring. Kronje was captain of the South African team, a hero at home and a born-again Christian. Kronje was staying at this hotel in Delhi but his luck was about to run out. Indian police had set up a phone tapping operation. The police weren't looking at cricket, they were investigating threats by criminals against a local businessman. Kronje could have had no idea that he'd unwittingly stepped into a trap meant for someone else. While monitoring those telephones, we overheard a conversation pertaining to cricket. Uh, betting on cricket. Also, it is very widely known that uh, certain uh, mafia gangs based in um, Gulf countries, they have been uh, heavily betting on cricket and uh, manipulating the results. In one of the monitorings of the cell phones, uh, we found that uh, it was Hansi Kronje's voice. Uh, he himself was in conversation uh, with one person. They were able to pinpoint where the conversation was taking place and identify the person Kronje was talking to. He was a prominent Indian bookmaker. Kronje told him that he's in uh, room 346 and uh, subsequent investigations confirmed that uh, the conversation was between Hansi Kronje who was in room 346. Kronje was heard to say that he'd spoken to three South African cricketers and had a plan for fixing the game. According to the transcript, the bookmaker says, everything's according to plan, they have to score at least 250, and if you score 270, it's off. OK, says Kronje. At dawn, Kronje went to see one of the South African bowlers. He said to me that uh, I must go for less than 50, uh, more than 50 in my 10 overs. So what he basically said, I must underperform in that game. and. Um, we mustn't score more than 270. The team mustn't score more than 270, otherwise the deal is off. And did he tell you how much money you would get as a result of this? Uh, 25,000 years, that was the amount I can remember. $25,000? Yeah. And what did you think of that? I thought, well, it's a lot of money, uh, but I don't think what the consequences may be. In the event, Kronje wasn't able to rig the game and no money changed hands. When the authorities back home were told that their hero had been overheard trying to fix a match, they refused to believe it. The allegations are outrageous. Uh, Hansi Cronier is a man of unquestionable honesty and integrity. Cronier himself then protested his innocence. The Indian government. And if you um, check my cash bank accounts. That, that, I think, is, is the only thing that's going to clear me. Because, as I've said, you know, I have not received any money. Well, I suppose he thought he was, he was beyond being caught, really. He was captain of the South African team. No one would... He mm. wouldn't be caught, you know. It was, it was easy money. It was, who would know? Ask the good people here to make the minimum, create the minimum of disturbance. In South Africa, an inquiry was set up to look at the allegations. The evidence the King Commission found was overwhelming. Cronje was forced to admit that he'd taken up to $15,000 from a bookmaker. He called it money for jam. Words cannot begin to describe the shame, humiliation and pain which I feel in the knowledge that I have inflicted this on others. People were absolutely speechless. It was as though the entire country came to a standstill. And of course, um, most South Africans, given that Hansi had been such a hero, such an icon, such a symbol, didn't want to believe that any of it was true. I thought to myself that, well, if we're going to struggle to win this test match and this guy is giving out money for, for jam, then uh, I'm not going to be stupid and not take it. So, unfortunately, I took the money and uh, it is a mistake that I made and uh, I accept it. Hansi Kronje 
uh, could have uh, had the rest of his life as being a demigod in his country, I suspect, similar to, to the reputation that Sir Donald Bradman has held all his life in, in, uh, in Australia, whereas now his life, in, in my view, and his reputation is completely ruined. In India, Cronje's partial admission now started to lift the lid on a scandal. It was much bigger and much wider than anyone had so far realised. And it was obviously continuing. Well, we have not yet um, uh, concluded our investigations. Uh, investigations uh, are still uh, to be completed in uh, UK as well as South Africa. There are so many questions pertaining to uh, other areas of investigation which have been thrown up. Come on, India! In India, One Day Internationals in particular have attracted sponsorship and there's big money and constant promotion. Betting on cricket is illegal in India, but the games are used for what's known as spread betting. Spread betting is, 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 is a clear indication of match fixing. Spread betting, for instance, works between two teams, X team will win the toss. Spread betting is uh, a particular batsman will get out at this score of 10. Spread betting is India shall not score more than 200 runs. Now, this, these are exact indicators of match fixing. There is no science in the world, there is no forecasting, there is no analysis in the world which can tell you in these two teams which team will win the toss today. Mr Gupta has been investigating illegal bookmakers and their links with international cricket. He agreed to show us one of the more well-to-do areas of Delhi where he says illegal bookmaking flourishes. We have busted three bookies here in this particular market. I have busted them. If their offices are here, but the places where the bookies actually operate are actually houses. The cash transaction, they are collected from shops. There are places which will appear to you like shops. There are, for instance, a jeweler shop here. There is a restaurant, which actually is a restaurant. But people come and take their betting money from there. In India, since Kranya was exposed, police have been raiding gambling dens all over the country. Last month, in this Delhi suburb, for instance, they went to this apartment block and found nearly two million rupees in cash. There were seven arrests, and police were keen to show us what they'd confiscated. But most significant was their discovery of betting records. These included recent games in which England had played. There's a match which is going on. One day matches are there, and the test match. Are these cricket matches cricket just, matches. just in India? No, no, all over India. All over what? the world. Cricket matches all, all over, over the world. world. Yeah. You've got bets here about uh, English, English Sri Lanka? Yeah, England Sri Lanka match, which was the second test match, played on 7th of March. And this is a list of all the people? All the people, yes. This is the match here, which was being. This is the bets. It's a huge amount of money. It's a huge money. And how were the odds set? For this particular That's match. what we are investigating. That's a matter to still to be invested to find out who are who are what you call fixing the rates. That we are looking into. That's a part of our investigation, and that is what we are looking into at present. And how likely is it that the source of that could be in Dubai and Sharjah? There's every possibility. The source is outside India, but we are we cannot disclose so far what evidence we have collected. That's straight down the ground, it's in the air. Nowhere More heroes were to be toppled by these investigations. Another captain, India's Mohammed Azruddin, was also about to fall. And the answer is six more. He was vulnerable to approaches because he had the information needed to make profitable bets. If bookmakers could get to the captain, they'd be betting on a certainty. From what I heard from the bookies, there's even betting as to who would open bowling on one end and who would open the bowling on the other end. Uh, at what point would they declare? These are things which are, you know, captain is the major chap who makes the decisions. And uh, 
he is the most important person. So if he has one or two persons with him, he can really do a lot of damage to the uh, match. What India's cricketing fans did not know was that their national hero was in the pay of a bookmaker. The bookmaker was M. K. Gupta. He'd gone out of his way to befriend cricketers. M. K. Gupta lives in this house in a well-to-do suburb of Delhi. He was out when we called. He was once a bank clerk, but studied international cricket and started taking bets in the street from those who didn't know as much. From the early 90s, he'd been meeting cricketers in hotels and paying them for information or fixing matches. He travelled the world and with insider information made his fortune from cricket gambling. According to Indian police, bookmakers were corrupting Azradin. In the Taj Palace Hotel in Delhi, there was even a special locker where money for Azradin was deposited by bookmakers. His hotel bills had actually been paid by M.K. Gupta. M.K. Gupta had all the right connections. Not only was Azradin in his pay, so was Kronya. This is the game Gupta wanted him to fix. South Africa against India at Kanpur in 1996. Kronya now admits he met the bookmaker. MK asked if we would give wickets away on the last day of that test to ensure that we lost. He asked me to speak to the other players and gave me approximately 30,000 US dollars in cash to do so. I led him to believe that I would. This seemed an easy way to make money, but I had no intention of doing anything. In Bombay, a few days later, MK Gupta tried again. This time, it was at the end of the tour. The South Africans were tired, some were ill. Most thought they'd lose anyway, so were surprised when a meeting was called in their hotel by Kronje. The team was asked to consider a bribe. I suppose the meeting came. Obviously, a bookie had approached Hansi. We didn't know about it, but it approached him at Kampur in the previous game. But I only know that in hindsight. But the bookie, same bookie had approached him and said, if you lose the game, there's a sum of 250,000 US dollars on it for you, you see. I think the general feeling was, gee, that sounds you know, quite interesting. Uh, you know, maybe this is a, w a way of making easy money. Um, so we didn't certainly say, tell the guy to get lost. But uh, we, I can remember saying that this is a thing that we can't get involved in as individuals. This must be, the whole team must be in. Or we must at least discuss it or we mustn't do it at all. Were you surprised when you heard this offer that he'd been approached and had money to... Absolutely, yeah, no. Devast I think, yes, yeah, surprise is a very good word. I mean, I was amazed, quite frankly, because I just didn't believe it was happening. Kronje then phoned the bookmaker and even got him to increase his offer. But there were people who were seriously considering whether or not to accept what was clearly a bribe. Yes, I would say, yeah, we, we, they were. Although Dave Richardson and the rest of the team decided in the end not to accept the bribe, the King Commission was clearly sceptical of Kronje. He was asked to explain how it was that after his earlier actions, he turned down this money for jam. One or two players were keen to go along with this plan. Why didn't you take it, tell nobody about it and get this money for jam? You. You yourself say how much you loved it. I don't know why I didn't take it. Um, there's no apparent reason in my mind why I didn't take it. It's hindsight a foolish decision, would you not say? I was very annoyed with myself for not taking it, yes. Kronje maintained that he only took money for information and not for fixing matches. But he certainly profited. According to the King Commission, he received nearly $130,000. These were the payments they knew about. What do you think has been the effect of the Hansi Cronier affair? Well, I think, as, as I say, that's one person. There's a lot more than that. I mean, Hansi Cronier, maybe he's got more to tell. Meant to, you know, he's a man of God. Maybe it's his chance to redeem himself. Do you think there's more to come in that affair? 
I'm sure there is. Last year, M.K. Gupta, the Delhi bookmaker who knew both captains, offered to tell India's Central Bureau of Investigation all he knew. Why did you put so much weight on the evidence of M.K. Gupta? Whatever he told us turned out to be true. It was corroborated by various aspects of investigation, in the various aspects of investigation. It was all corroborated. The homes of several top Indian cricketers were now raided by income tax inspectors. In the case of the team's captain, they wanted to discover how Azraddin had managed to amass so many cars and so many different properties. We searched his house, uh, various properties which belonged to Mr. Azaruddin and uh, people related to him were searched. And we found a lot of uh, unexplained assets, a lot, uh, lot of properties, a lot of wealth, which is far beyond what he ever earned in his life. Do you actually have evidence that Azaruddin did fix a cricket match? Yes, in fact, uh, Azaruddin himself has accepted before us that he fixed matches. M.K. Gupta has told us specific matches which he fixed and he gained money. Azruddin may have made a police confession but refused to admit in public that he'd done wrong. I totally deny these allegations and uh, treat them with all the contempt they deserve. I am innocent and uh, I am ready to face any investigation which the cricket board may initiate in this matter. India's cricket followers were not convinced. They chanted that their captain was a cheat and match fixer. Although he's appealed, Azruddin has been banned for life. The reputation of the game, until now outwardly respectable, had become tarnished by the temptations of cash. The temptation certainly is there. The ICC hasn't got the ability to obviously outlaw or get rid of uh, gambling or corruption. What we've got to make sure is that the cricketers of the future aren't tempted. If you don't get to the core and you don't uh, remove the core, the nerve centre, it's much bigger than people realise. It's not just, as you say, you know, a phone call from a bookie and... It, no, no, it doesn't work that way, I don't think. There's too many people involved, I think and there's too much money involved. In India, the police now turn their attention to Bombay, the home of Bollywood, the Indian film industry, and the country's commercial centre. Investigators were keen to discover whether there were links between cricketers, bookmakers, Bollywood, and the underworld in the Gulf. Indian journalists secretly recorded an interview with an Indian actress in Bombay. She knew bookmakers and cricketers and said it was common knowledge that games had been fixed in the 1999 World Cup in England. We are still intrigued at the uh, underworld uh, connections uh, um, with the Indian cricketers. Uh, we would like to know a lot, lot more. You must be aware of what's happening in the Bombay underworld, frequent, uh, uh, violence, frequent violence involving uh, principal characters in the Bombay film world. Who, are, who have kind of a tremendous fear of the underworld because there is evidence that some of the underworld is financing Bombay film world. In England, the 1999 World Cup opened with all the public relations trappings. Every national team was going to take part and Indian police watched as their bookmakers flocked to London. Uh, bets were being placed uh, on these matches and uh, we had uh, three, four good cases uh, where arrests were made and uh, cash was recovered and uh, the documents, betting documents were also recovered. We have no evidence that World Cup matches were fixed, but we understand that two months later, bookmakers who were staying at this London hotel after flying from Bombay did try to fix another game. Chris Lewis, an England player who'd never been in contact with bookmakers before, was the cricketer they decided to approach. Oh, that's a beauty. 
Through a family friend, they told him they were in the entertainment business and wanted to put a proposition to him. They wanted me to provide them with information um, as regards to pitch conditions, what I th how I thought the game would actually go um, day by day. Um, they also wanted me to um, contact certain players and see if those players were interested um, in actually, I suppose, performing to order, performing um, for money. And uh, different figures um, were mentioned to me. What uh, sort of figures? What did they say? We're, we're talking in the region of sort of two to 250,000 pounds to actually arrange a one-day game and 300,000 pounds to arrange a favourable result in a test match. When it came to match fixing and getting me involved, um, at different times, certain comments came out, as in, everybody is doing it, this person, every country is doing it, and, and those sort of comments. Um, it also went to the point where he was more specific and named players, um, players in the England team, that he said that he knows that have actually taken bribes. He didn't say that he actually himself had bribed them, but he said he knows that they have. Those players have never been named in public. Chris Lewis reported the approach and the allegations are still being investigated. The game the bookmakers wanted Chris Lewis to fix was England versus New Zealand at Old Trafford in September 1999. It was England's first series after the World Cup. That's a big shout, he's gone. The approach is now the subject of an inquiry by Scotland Yard. Only weeks before the Cronje scandal broke, England came to South Africa. Their last game in the Test Series was at Centurion Park near Pretoria. South Africa's captain was Hansi Cronje. But rain had interrupted much of the play and it looked as if the match would be drawn. On the fourth evening of this test, Cronje was phoned on his mobile by a professional gambler. The caller wanted him to declare early and make a game of it. Hansi picked up the phone, said, Hansi, I introduced him myself, who I was, etc. And I gave him the suggestion. At the time, yes, to get his attention, etc., I said, listen, what about the donation of about 200,000 Rand, if you can get this to happen from a, to, to a charity of your choice? Now, that was also part of him to listen to. Why normally should the member of a South African cricket team listen to any total stranger? Normally you'd probably be told to go jump in the lake. Marlon Aronstam, self-confessed cricket lover and bookie, um, phones up Cronier. It's the time of the fifth test against England at Centurion Park in January 2000. He leaves me messages on Cronier's cell phone and within a matter of hours Aaron Stam is in Cronier's hotel room. And he said, OK, likes idea, and if he can pull it off, he'll call me back and let me know. A few hours later, Aaron Stam received a text message from Cronier on his mobile phone. And the message is, be patient, working on it, possible game. OK. Suddenly, the message is, we have a game. So I went to Centurion. There I saw, bang, there's a declaration. I said, I can't believe it. I actually pulled this off. I was shocked. Now, I told all my friends about it. They all said I was mad. I said, I'm telling you, there's going to be a game tomorrow. Aronstam says he was too late to make any money out of this game, and he certainly could have done. The match turned out to be an unexpected win for England. But Cronje made money. Aronstam paid him 53,000 rand, and the text messages continued. Why did he keep sending you text messages on your mobile phone after you had paid him 53,000 rand? But that's what I paid him the 53,000 rand for, to get all the information for the following one day series coming up, hopefully for information coming up. The 53,000 the 50, rand was paid to him as a deposit for information for the future. The 3,000 rand was paid because he gave me good information on one match. So how much money did you make out of gambling on cricket as a result of the information that you got from Hansi Kroenke? Well, each, that's certain things I can't, that's the certain things that's, I don't know, if you had to ask me exactly now, I can't tell you either. I didn't, uh, each match is a different uh, event. But your investment was covered? From what I gave him? Yes. Sure.
In India, police were now closing in on the bookmakers Kronya and others had been talking to. It was here that they'd first overheard his conversations about cricket details. They arrested several bookmakers connected with the monitored calls and the bribery allegations. Police also arrested a film star from Bombay. They were investigating possible links between Bollywood criminals and cricketers like Kronje. And there was another link. There'd been hundreds of unexplained calls to a certain man in South Africa. They were also talking to a common number, a South African number. This number was subsequently identified to be that of Hamid Qasim Benju. Hamid Qasim Banjo owns a sweet shop in Johannesburg. The police believed that he was also a link between Kronje, bookmakers and the Gulf. That person had to be somebody who was either uh, the key or who was uh, trying to control the situation. In the recordings, the name of Sharjah had been mentioned. Kronje's next destination happens to have been Sharjah. What sort of questions would you like to ask Hansi Kronje about links with Sharjah? There is, as I mentioned, there is a hint of uh, some link in Sharjah which needs to be investigated. The name Sharjah has figured in the conversation. It possibly means that uh, there is a link. There is an obvious link. In March last year, Kronje came to Sharjah to play in a three-way series of one-day internationals. According to the King Commission, Hamid Kasim Banjo, the Johannesburg sweet shop owner, also came here to contact Kronje again. Whilst I was in Dubai for the Sarja Cup in March of this year, I was again contacted by Hamid. He indicated that he wished to resume contact with me along the same lines as in India. I had by now developed sufficient resolve to put it all behind me and told him that I was not interested. But Kronje also admitted to the King Commission that when he was in Sharjah, he was telephoned by yet another anonymous caller who said he'd pay him $100,000 before the game and $100,000 afterwards. And I'm just scandalised, frankly, that, that one-day cricket continues to be played in Sharjah, that the ICC continue to sanction uh, cricket tournaments in Sharjah. Do you accept that there might have been match-fixing here in Sharjah? I, uh, until I have proof, I cannot disclaim that or, or, or say that I, I don't know. I mean, like I said, who are we to tell who, which player, which book he called, which player where? I mean, it's really difficult to say that there was or wasn't. But one thing I can say, the Sharjah matches are of such high prof profile that they are watched so closely by so many people, as you see now, and watched on television so closely. It will be very difficult for a player to, to, be, to, be, to be fixing matches here because it's so obvious that people are watching every move, every stroke, every ball. This year, India pulled out of the latest Sharjah tournament. Coca-Cola cancelled its sponsorship. But the ICC has so far made no comment. The whole of the match fixing and corruption matter is, is a very complex and at times legalistic process, regrettably. At the present time in regard to Sharjah, though, uh, there is an investigation underway uh, that is uh, been put together by the United Arab Emirates uh, uh, people uh, I understand that an interim report from that investigation has gone to the United Arab Emirates uh, Association, but as yet the ICC has not received a copy of it. Hansi Kronje, the South African hero who threw away his career, is now waiting for the final verdict of the King Commission. The crowd is silent, but the South Africans are joyous. He also faces possible charges in India. Oh, oh. Henry Williams, his former teammate, did not accept money. But he was suspended for six months for not reporting the offer. He said later he thought it had only been a joke. He's had to pay a personal price for what Cronier did. Has Hansi Cronier ruined cricket? 
in a way, yeah, he did, because he left the mark, he left the scandal mark. Cricket and cricket officials lost credibility over, over match fixing, uh, and we have to win the confidence of the public back again. The ICC is about to publish the interim Condon report into match fixing. It's likely to confirm that corruption continues. Whether it's too late now to salvage the gentleman's game will still be an open question. I think there's a lot more to come around the world. I mean, it's, it's unfortunately a topic that doesn't go away. It doesn't go away on its own. If you'd like to comment on the issues raised in tonight's programme, you can contact us on our website.